The Leadville Trail 100 is one of the most grueling mountain bike race... Hold on a second. Sorry, I, I think the script has a typo or something. Hey, are they really still calling Leadville a mountain bike race? Sorry about that. Apparently Leadville still is a mountain bike race. Apparently that mile and a half of single track makes up for the other 100 plus miles of double track gravel and pavement. Look, all jokes aside, I think that doing Leadville on anything other than a cross-country mountain bike would be a mistake. Could you get through it on a gravel bike? Yeah, sure, but I don't think it would be the fastest. That being said, even though over 99% of the Leadville participants will do the race on a standard mountain bike, because of the unique demands of the course, Leadville has been a breeding ground for some unique bike setups. And this year, I was not the only pro rider to embrace the Franken bike in the pursuit of all out speed. Today, I'll be talking about my personal bike setup, how my race went on that bike this year, and about my predictions on the changing landscape of Leadville, given that perhaps the most notable rider in the race, Keegan Swenson, has now come over to the dark side. Welcome back to the channel. This video is fueled by The Feed, and it's also brought to you by Bicycle, which is the largest global marketplace for pre-owned bikes. Check the link down in the description below to learn more. Undown was undoubtedly my biggest goal of the year, but Leadville is a close second. <laughs> well, getting your Leadville video out in a timely manner clearly wasn't part of that goal. What did this race happen like a month ago? Leadville is also part of the Lifetime Grand Prix and is probably the second most prestigious race in the series behind Unbound and arguably the most prestigious mountain bike race in the US. Leadville is a very unique race for multiple reasons. The most notable of which is probably the altitude. The race starts in the town of Leadville, Colorado at an altitude of 10,000 feet or 3,000 meters and tops out at 12,400 feet or nearly 3,800 meters. Now, while those altitude numbers do sound very scary and may make for a very dramatic video about how I had to dig deep with so little oxygen available to me, you know, everything you've heard about Leadville a thousand times before. I want to tell you, it's going to hurt out there. It's going to hurt real bad. But when it does, you just keep digging deep and say to yourself, one thing, one thing, Leadville, Leadville. Anything more is not necessary. Anything less is not enough. Personally, that's not what excites me the most about Leadville. I like how the terrain of the Leadville course makes bike setup such a puzzle. If you don't know what I'm talking about, let me explain. The first thing you'll notice from the profile is that there is a lot of climbing with nearly 12,000 feet of elevation gain in 100 miles or 3,600 meters in 160 kilometers for everyone else in the world. That being said, there are some significant flat sections of the course that are either on gravel, pavement, or wide open double track where drafting and aerodynamics matters a lot. The climbs and descents are not particularly technical by normal mountain bike standards, but can be rocky and or bumpy, and yes, in this mountain bike race, there is only one and a half miles of single track in it, and it is pretty tame single track at that. So to summarize, this is a course that's not technical by mountain bike standards, but it can be rough, rocky, and bumpy in certain sections, and then in other sections, very smooth and fast. It's a course where the weight of the bike matters a lot given the amount of climbing, but then also aero and drafting matters quite a bit given the amount of flat sections. Given this information, which bike would you choose? I know, it's not so easy, right? Now given that this is labeled a mountain bike race, probably almost everyone will show up on a normal cross-country mountain bike. But this ignores a very key component of the equation, which is the aerodynamics on the flat sections. Riding a mountain bike in the standard mountain bike position is probably the least aerodynamic setup possible. However, riding a gravel bike ignores the fact that a lot of the course is extremely bumpy and massive amounts of time will be lost on the descents, and the bike will probably be less efficient on the rough climbs as well. So I'm not going to beat around the bush anymore. Real fans of the channel will know what I rode for this race last year. And with the amount that I talk about drop bar mountain bikes on this channel, I think some of you are probably tired of hearing about it. But yes, this year I did put drop bars on my mountain bike. 
again for this race, and I'll talk about that more in just a minute. But first, I think I have to address this before I move on. Those of you who followed the race already know that I was not the only pro to break the status quo with my Leadville bike this year. The course record holder and the far and away favorite to take the win, none other than the current king of US off-road racing, Keegan Swenson ditched his standard mountain bike bars that got him the course record last year in favor of drop bars, and one of his training partners and fellow hitters, Russell Finsterwald, did the same. Yeah, this race was about to get very interesting. Well, I guess that is if you find very niche corners of cycling, like putting drop bars on a mountain bike interesting. Ugh. I don't know if you guys realize this, but this is the worst thing that could have possibly happened to cycling. Now that a rider with some actual talent just so happened to do the same thing that this guy did, his ego is practically leaking out of his ears. Like I said, I've spoken about drop bar mountain bikes plenty on this channel, but I want to do a breakdown for this course specifically and defend my argument that as ugly and as unconventional as they may be, they are the fastest bikes for this unconventional race. Using some rough calculations for the arrow penalty of riding in the mountain bike position versus the drop bar position, I have broken down the race into sections and made a note of the difference in time between these setups. Now I will fully admit that some estimations needed to be made here, but if anything I favored the flat bars in my calculations by taking out any sections of the course where you could do the puppy pause position and therefore it didn't matter which bar you were using and I gave more of a penalty to the drop bars than I probably should have on the descents on the course. For example, I gave a 30 second penalty to the drop bars on the power line descent, but in reality, I actually clocked my fastest time ever down power line with drop bars last year on race day. Those that are more familiar with the Leadville course can pause the video and check out my calculations for each section, but the final result is clear. The drop bars beat out the traditional flat bars by over six minutes. Is six minutes gonna take you from, oh, I don't know, 17th place to the win? No, it's not. But in my case last year, six minutes would have costed me six places. So let's hear it, keyboard warriors and armchair bike racers. Let me know why I'm an idiot for not continuing to follow the status quo. I genuinely want to know. Inevitably, no matter how much math I do, I will still get comments like, all this work just to get beaten by a guy with flat bars, and you know Keegan Swenson had flat bars when he won, right? That is, until this year. With Keegan riding drop bars, if he was able to break his own course record, then those people would have nothing to say, which is kind of a selfish reason that I had personally for wanting to see him pull it off. But beyond that, if he did clock the fastest Leadville time ever with a drop bar mountain bike, then the race would change forever. Leadville would no longer be a mountain bike race. It would be a drop bar mountain bike race, and times would be faster because of it. See what I mean? Okay, that might be one of the longest intros to a race report video that I've ever done, but I really wanted you to get the full context of what was about to go down here. With that though, let's get into how the race played out. Because of the altitude of this race, pacing is extremely important. Quite a bit more important than at sea level because it is extremely easy to blow up when you're this high. Last year, I paced the race almost perfectly, doing nearly the same power on the last climb as I did on the first climb, which for me was a target of 280 watts. 280 may not sound like a lot, but that would be a sea level equivalent of 345 watts. Yes, this is Leadville, so I get to do that thing where I overinflate my power numbers by giving you the much more impressive sea level equivalent. Anyway, this year in training, my power at altitude was looking quite a bit better than last year, and I was doing easily 20 to 30 watts more during my intervals. As a result, I decided to bump that climbing pace up to 300 watts, which would be a sea level equivalent of 370. Whew. I'm sweating just thinking about it. Here's how it went. The race starts with six miles of slight downhill road and gravel before starting the first climb, which only required an NP of 220 watts to stay in the peloton, but when we hit the first climb, I quickly adopted my own pace and let the others sprint away from me at a pace that was far from sustainable. Again, if this race was at sea level, I wouldn't be doing this. I would be trying to stay with the front group for as long as possible, but this is probably only a good strategy for the top 10, maybe even top five. Yes, drafting matters at this race, but 
Arguably pacing matters even more. Sticking to my plan, I did an NP of 307 for 22 minutes on the first climb of the day and found myself in a group containing the likes of former winner Todd Wells and other strong riders like Zach Colton. Despite this, most of the pulling between the first and the second climb was done by me as I was probably the one that stayed the most within their limit on the first climb or everyone else is just a smarter tactician than I am, and they let that idiot with the drop bars do the work on the front. At the top of the first climb, I was sitting in 36th place, but when you pace yourself correctly at Leadville, you will end up catching a lot of riders that did not pace themselves throughout the race, which is what I intended on doing. I led into the second climb up to the power line descent, but Zach Calton passed and dropped me on this section, and he was the only rider in this group of about 10 to do so. Even on this second climb, I was already catching riders that had gone out too hard, and by the top, I was now up to 30th. And on that climb, I did another 304 watt NP for just under 24 minutes. At the bottom of Powerline, I found myself in a decent group containing about 10 riders. Again though, I found myself doing the majority of the work leading into the Columbine climb, which is the biggest climb of the day that goes up to the halfway point, and the turnaround. The one exception was Tiago Ferreira, who's got quite a resume including world championship titles and the Olympics in 2016. He was willing to trade poles, but mostly on the climbs and rolling sections of the course. I don't mean to stroke my own ego too much, but I do think that my superior aero position was too much for anyone to match anytime we were riding on a flat or slight downhill section. And anytime somebody pulled through, we significantly reduced our speed, and I had people to catch, so I just stayed on the front. This meant 277 watts for a little over an hour, and to be honest, this may have been a mistake, or maybe I'd just been going too hard for the entire first third of the race, because then we hit Columbine. As I started up Columbine, I still felt pretty good. I was holding 300 watts, and I was catching riders. About halfway up though, I started to realize that this pace was too hard, which is fine because we are going up in altitude, so I was okay with letting my power drift down. As I approached the top though, I really started to crack and my power did a bit more than just drift. In fact, in the first 30 minutes of the climb, I did 299 watts NP and then in the second half, that dropped to an abysmal 259 watts, making for 282 watts for an hour of the entire climb. Now, to be fair, 259 watts at this highest altitude point of the race is a sea level equivalent of 332, so not a bad pace by any means, but I had fallen off the mark. When I got to the bottom though, I quickly realized that the second half of this race was going to turn into a death march in the very near future. The fatigue had set in and I attempted to mitigate it by taking on more food, but nutrition wasn't my issue here. Luckily, I found myself in a decent group of about five riders to work with on the flats, and at this point in the race, I was battling these riders for a top 20 spot. On this rolling section of the course with this group, I managed an NP of 246 watts, which, as you may remember, is over 30 watts less than what I did on the way out. Things would get really ugly when we hit power line though, and I found myself dropped from that group managing just 240 watts for 36 minutes. I felt absolutely awful at this point in the race. I imagine most people do given that it's so late in the race and it's such a tough climb, but I started to reevaluate everything I'd done leading up to this point. Last year, I paced myself so well and was putting out such good numbers on this climb, and this year I was crawling. I think it was clear that I had just chosen a pacing number that was too high. Luckily though, I still had Brayden Lang as a carrot to chase, and by the top, I passed him and dropped him. On the final climb of the day, I actually got a bit of a second win and managed 273 watts for 25 minutes. Nothing too special, but given how bad I felt 30 minutes earlier, this felt like a big win, and by this point I was in 22nd place in the race, with one descent and one false flat drag to the finish line remaining. I caught a glimpse of another rider at the top of the climb, and sure enough, on the false flat section, I had caught Kyle Trudeau. I attacked him as I made the catch, but he quickly got on my wheel, so I gave myself about two minutes to catch my breath, and then attacked again. I did not want this to come down to a sprint finish. Fortunately, that attack snapped the elastic and I rode into the finish to take 21st place in a time of 6 hours, 29 minutes, and 22 seconds. 
By the way, that final 12 minutes where I made the catch and attacked was a pretty monstrous effort for that late in the day and at that altitude when I look back at it, requiring 312 watts, and the attacks themselves were 40 seconds at just over 500 watts with 800 watt peaks. So the time I got this year was about two and a half minutes slower than the time I got last year, which is basically within the margin of error, especially when you consider the fact that the conditions this year were probably a little bit slower, but that's neither here nor there. My pacing for the race this year was obviously worse though. I took two minutes out of my time on the way out from last year, but then on the way back, I was four minutes slower. Now, it could have been way worse. There are plenty of people, in fact, I would say most, that end up going out way too hard, and then at some point on the way back, end up blowing up catastrophically. But at Leadville, I pride myself on actually pacing the thing correctly, as opposed to what most people do, which is blow up. But I guess this year I'm just like everyone else. Numbers from the whole race still do show what an effort this was though. I managed 264 watts NP for the whole race, which is five watts higher than last year, 229 average power, 153 average, and 169 max heart rate, 16.1 miles per hour average speed, 46 miles per hour max down power line, and 5,400 kilojoules. Even though I did finish 21st place overall in the race, out of the lifetime Grand Prix riders, I did finish, oh boy, I can't believe I'm about to say this again, 17th place. Yeah, I'm starting to convince I'm cursed at this point. This result meant that I was barely holding on to a top 10 in the overall. Top 10 in the Grand Prix is in the money and on the super wide angle podium at the end of the season, so I would really love to maintain that placing if I could, but there are still three more GP races to go, so a lot can change. And finally, you know we can't end this video without talking some more about drop bars. Did they actually go faster on the Leadville course, and are they the future of this race? Well, if you just look at the results page, then maybe not. Now, I did drop bars last year too, so it's not really a great comparison, but the rider we all had our eye on, Keegan Swenson, did not break his course record on the drop bar bike this year. In fact, instead of going six minutes faster, as I predicted, he actually went six minutes slower, but he did have a flat tire and had to ride for probably five miles with that flat. Keegan almost never flats either, so the only thing that I can assume is that this is the spirit of mountain biking punishing him for taking things too far. I have no idea how much time that flat cost him, but I can assume it was a decent amount. Well, if there's anything that I've learned from watching your career, it's that the more you care about marginal gains, the fewer races you win. Keegan, turn back now before it's too late. Russell Finsterwald was the only one of the three of us that ended up clocking a faster time, saving about four minutes over his time from last year. And given that the course conditions were probably slower this year, that is impressive. So are we gonna see drop bars take over Leadville next year? Probably not, but I do think that we will see more drop bar mountain bikes at Leadville than we ever have. But we are going to have to wait a little bit longer before a drop bar bike holds the course record here. Thanks for watching. If you want to follow my racing closer, be sure to check me out on Instagram. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a like, subscribe, and share it with your cycling friends. I'll see you in the next one.